moment, we will ask Dean Moore to say just a few words about um, several things that are special about this event, the, the Collins Chair, and the legacy uh, that we have here of the three speakers who are in our midst today. And then we'll tell you a little bit more about each one. Uh, they will each speak for about uh, 10, 15 minutes. Actually, we'll hear from one of our speakers twice as a kind of bookend on uh, some of what we're discussing. Then there will be time for a group interaction, Q&A. Uh, there's some discussions that we may have in small groups together, so there will be a chance for us to interact. Uh, this, The formal part of this program will conclude around noonish. For those of you who are here wanting uh, CEUs, continuing education credits, please uh, stick around. Hopefully you registered and there will be box lunches for those of you who did, did register. And we'll talk about the particulars of the logistics for the CEU at that point. Okay, so that's how we're going to go. Dean Moore. Servant leadership in action. <laughs>
thank you, Dean Moore. Introducing our speakers in the order in which they will address us. The Reverend Dr. Norman E. Thomas holds the PhD degree from BU School of Theology and is Professor Emeritus of World Christianity at United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. From 1978 to 1983, he directed the program in Mission and Evangelism here, and as such was Professor Roberts, the immediate professor, uh, predecessor of Professor David Roberts. He has said that her appointment was, quote, a major advance at BU, unquote. <laughs> Many of us would definitely agree. <laughs> Dr. Thomas was a Distinguished Alumnus Award recipient of the BU School of Theology about three years ago. And his most recent book is on the theme of the Edinburgh Conference. It's so recent that it was published about a week ago, I believe. Uh, it's uh, entitled Missions and Unity Lessons from History 1792 to 2010. So please take a look as you can. Dr. Thomas <coughs> currently lives in Pasadena. Dr. Dana Robert is Truman Collins Professor of World Christianity and History of Mission here at the New School of Theology, and she co-directs the Center for Global Christianity and Mission. Her renown as a historian of mission was internationally endorsed at the Edinburgh Centenary, where she delivered the keynote address. In the months preceding the conference, Professor Robert told some of us that she felt some pressure knowing that the keynoter in 1910 was the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> we at STH, of course, never had any doubts that she would hold her own, and that is certainly the word that has come back to us since then. Professor Robert has most recently written <coughs> Joy to the World, Mission in the Age of Global Christianity, produced as a study for the 2010-2011 summer schools of mission for the United Methodist Church. She's also written Christian Mission, how Christianity became a world religion. The Reverend Dr. Capio John Palma is a PhD graduate of BU School of Theology as of this year, and a student of Professor David Robert and Professor Martinez de Mio. He is also an Anglican priest with particular interest in ecological ethics and mission, and in this capacity presented a paper at the Edinburgh meeting. In relation to another recent study he produced on behalf of Public Research Associates entitled Globalizing the Culture Wars, U.S. Conservatives, African Churches, and Homophobia, he was testifying before the United States Congress at the United Nations and has appeared on numerous radio and television programs, including the Rachel Maddow Show. Currently, Dr. Coma is Rector of Christ Church Hyde Park here in Boston and is also working with the NAACP to produce a curriculum on education on climate change for use in black churches. We are delighted and honored to have this legacy of uh, connections, three generations of BU School of Theology professors and graduates and experts. So thank you, Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's so good to be here, a reunion with friends that I've known across the year and chance to make new friends. Um, if this were a professional wrestling event, the three of us would be called a tag team. <laughs> I would like you to imagine that you were on the planning committee for Edinburgh 1910. <coughs> what kind of conference would you have wanted it to be? Who would you have wanted to attend? What outcomes would you have hoped for and prayed for? But first, I need to put your assignment in historical perspective. Edinburgh 1910 was not the first World Missionary Conference. That title was held by two conferences held in New York and London in 1854. And then alternating between those two cities, conferences were held about every 10 years, each with increasing numbers of participants. 
Now, how many of you have heard of the Ecumenical Missionary Conference of 1900? Do I see your hands? Oh, we have a well-informed audience, but let me tell the rest of you also about it. Centered at Carnegie Hall in New York, plenary addresses also fill nearby churches and halls. An estimated 160,000 to 200,000 people participate in one or more of the 500 events of the Ecumenical Missionary Conference of 2000. Seated on the platform for the inaugural session was William Harrison, the uh, former president of the United States, William McKinley, the sitting president of the United States, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who was to be the next president of the United States. Most of the cabinet were there for the conference. Without a doubt, this was the largest missionary conference that has ever been held, even up to today. And now, you're on the planning committee for the sequel in 1910. Can you imagine trying to plan a sequel for that conference? Well, already you've received an invitation from mission leaders in Edinburgh, Scotland, Scottish church and mission leaders, uh, an invitation to hold the conference in Edinburgh in 1910. The North American Conference, North American Foreign Mission Boards, has invited you to be a part of this planning committee. Now, fortunately for you, you have some persons of experience who are serving with you. Two of them, Dana will tell us more about tonight, Robert Spear and John R. Mott, who began the student volunteer movement way back in 1886, and now we're leaders in it. As you discuss together, it becomes clear that the 1900 conference, large as it was, had many weaknesses. It was talk, 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 and no action. There was no ongoing continuation committee. There was no paid executive that could carry out the thoughts of persons who attended that conference. So the only legacy of 1900 was that individual renewed enthusiasm for missions and giving to missions that resulted from participants who attended. Now fortunately, you have some other models of how to hold a large conference. For two conferences that have taken place since 1900 that were very important. One was a missionary conference held in Madras, India in 1902. It instead of inviting the general public to come, had delegates from mission agencies. Instead of listening to papers read and speeches given, each delegate worked on one of nine committees to study a particular mission issue to draft resolutions and propose joint action. We also have the example of the Shanghai Missionary Conference of 1907. Because it's Shanghai, they added to this model a preparatory study process by committees that prepared draft reports in advance. You as if the committee to, with the Scots, plan for Edinburgh 1910, proposed that Edinburgh be preceded by eight study commissions. Their reports incorporated more than 1,000 replies from missionaries and national leaders around the world and their inputs were incorporated in those reports, <coughs> which are published in the Edinburgh volumes, eight volumes of reports of the study work done before Edinburgh 1910. Another important innovation was the creation of an advisory committee with J.H. Oldham, a name that becomes very important in ecumenical circles later. He was just 34 years of age. He was a Scot. He had served with the YMCA in India, and they appointed him as full-time secretary of the Edinburgh 1910 Conference. The one action 
taken to them. Only action taken was to form a continuation committee and to have this structure and the secretariat after the conference. An extremely important innovation, but with these models preceding it that you use. Now to Edinburgh came 1,200 delegates. You can see them seated on the ground floor. Um, notice the composition. See any persons of color? Well, they're very scarce. Most of them are white male. However, there were uh, two, over 200 women delegates out of the 1,200. And there were even more women that participated in the preparatory study process. Fortunately, and these were delegates from missionary societies in North America, Great Britain, and continental Europe. Fortunately, they included in their number 19 church leaders from Asia and Africa. 19 from Asia and one from Africa. Their voices were heard at Edinburgh with appreciation and remarkable impact. The young V.S. Azariah, co-founder of the first Indian Missionary Society in 1903, gave a powerful speech calling for equality and friendship between missionaries and Indian Christians. Using Paul's imagery from Ephesians and 1 Corinthians, he said, the exceeding riches of the glory of Christ cannot fully be realized by the Englishman, the American, and the continental alone, nor by the Japanese or the Chinese or the Indians by themselves, but by all working together, worshiping together, and learning together the perfect image of, of our Lord and Christ. You have given goods to feed the poor. You have given your bodies to be burned. We also ask for love. Give us friends. The youngest delegate at Edinburgh, 28 years old, Cheng Jingyi of China, electrified the hall in his contribution to the discussion on the topic cooperation and the promotion of unity. Denominationalism has never interested the Chinese mind, he began. It, he finds no delight in it but sometimes he suffers for it. The only obstacles, he said, to the formation of a united church in China would be, quote, due to our Western friends and not ourselves. Speaking plainly, he continued, we hope to see in the near future a united Christian <coughs> church without any denominational distinction. Now you may have thought that came from 1948, 1950 in China. It came from the inspiration of Cheng Jingyi back in 1910. Cheng's seven minute speech was judged so important that the full text of it was included in the conference's final report. Four galleries full of observers, you see some of them up there in the balcony, including many missionaries, listen intently while Edinburgh delegates discuss key issues raised by the eight study commissions. How should Christians carry the gospel to all the world in our generation? What should the Christian message be in relation to non-Christian religions? How should missionaries and their new churches relate to colonial governments? How can the educational work of the missions be more effective? How can the younger churches on the mission field be most effective in organization, membership, and leadership? Can the missionary training be improved for a changing world? How can the home base of missions be strengthened in its commitment and in its spirituality? How can Christians and missions unite and work together for the improvement of the world? Now these eight remain the key issues 
says there were conferences, mission conferences, held in the next 50 years. And the nine volumes of Edinburgh continue to be used by persons as a resource in thinking through the key issues in this year. And we have imagined that you were one of the visionaries who planned for this important conference. Fortunately, Edinburgh became a powerful catalyst for the movements of Christian unity that were to follow. Financed by John D. Rockefeller and others, John R. Mott took the lead <coughs> from the worldwide MCA, where he was the executive, to travel through Asia and Africa, sharing the vision and insights from Edinburgh. This was part of the follow-up. National Christian conferences were held in India and China and Japan with active participation by far more national leaders together with missionaries. Majority of national leaders at those meetings. In the next day, decade, the National Continuation Committees that were formed eventually became national councils of churches in each of those countries. And then, of course, important are those three streams of unity, the uh, open graph that flowed out of Edinburgh 1910. The faith and order movement, concerned with issues of Christian doctrine, and ministry, and worship of the sacraments. The life and work movement, holding also world conferences on issues of justice, economic and political justice, and peace and racism. They were to flow together to form the WCC in 1948. And the third stream became the International Missionary Council formed in 1921. But before that, a very important journal uh, edited by J.H. Holden, the International Review of Missions, it now dropped the S, has continued since that time uh, a project of the International Missionary Council. And they continued on with many important conferences until they too joined the World Council of Churches in 1961. Truly, Edinburgh, 1910, was the birthplace of the modern ecumenical movement. Archbishop William Temple of the Church of England, who had been a youth steward at Edinburgh, judged the conference to be the greatest event in the life of the church for a generation. In hindsight, however, Edinburgh 1910 had serious flaws. It ignored the urgent need to evangelize the vast numbers of nominal Christians in Europe, North America, and Latin America. They had been excluded from consideration at the conference by the assistance of high church Anglicans, who argued that Christendom included all those countries in which the majority were baptized Christians. And although at Edinburgh there was an informal meeting of persons concerned about Latin America, and follow-up meetings were to come afterward, uh, there was no Latin American church representation at Edinburgh. Also, Edinburgh 1910 excluded discussing questions of doctrine, such as modes of baptism. Rather than agreeing on a statement of doctrine to be signed by all delegates, as later we learned was the pattern that the Lausanne movement took on with their covenant. Um, the Credentials Committee looked at the mission, at the doctrinal statements of each of the sending mission societies and approved them. So there was no formal discussion of doctrine there. But the worst deficiency of Edinburgh 1910 was the exclusion of delegates from the non-Western missionary societies. Like the yes, Azariah could have come as the representative of a national missionary society in India instead of from the church missionary society in India. 
Why did the largest missionary conference in history, the New York Ecumenical Missionary Conference of 1900, have no centennial observances in the year 2000? Why has Edinburgh been celebrated this year as a stimulus for 21st century mission? From Havana to Bangalore, from Tokyo to Edinburgh to Cape Town, and now to Boston. To help you answer those questions, let's hear from Dana Robert on thematic developments from 1910 to 2010. here today and I'd like to, there's so many people in the room I'd like to recognize. Oops, I need some check a lot. Um, I'll let uh, Dr. Parsons use, use her tech a lot of scale to restore the PowerPoint. <laughs> but I'd like to, I, there's one person in the room I have got to recognize and that is my teacher, Charles Horton. <laughs> of Norm Thomas, his first year of teaching, and the, and the teacher of Dave Dawson behind you. Anybody else? So this is, so Dr. Foreman, I didn't know you were going to come, and so with, with all of my students in the room here, you're the grandfather <laughs> to many of the people in the room here. And for many years, uh, Charles Foreman was the professor of mission at Yale Divinity School, and you were also was at the head of the Theological Education Fund, or going around uh, Southeast Asia, helping to establish theological seminaries throughout Southeast Asia back in the 1950s and 60s. And that, that's a, um, a big piece of history. I believe a book has just come out on some of that. But that's an important piece of history we forget that part of the ecumenical movement about which Dr. Thomas was speaking, part of its responsibility was to facilitate theological education around the world. And Charles Foreman was a big piece of that kind of unwritten history and major effort. So we're thrilled that you can be here. Now my task is to just pick several themes that have led us from 1910 to 2010. Clearly this is an impossible task. I have to be arbitrary and choose several things that I think are the most important developments between 1910 and 2010. I dare say just the history of ecumenism would not have been enough for people all over the world to want to celebrate Edinburgh 1910. Something else has happened during the 20th century that makes us celebrating this event and using it as a starting point for 21st century mission reflection, such uh, a gripping idea to people all over the world. And then after I speak about some of these developments in the 20th century, Dr. Thomas Norm will get back up and talk a bit about the conferences that took place this year. And then Dr. Kaoma, who was a, 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 of the three of us, he was the only one who was a genuine delegate at the Edinburgh 2010 conference, and he'll then debrief us about that conference and give us a forward vision. The three themes that I've selected then are the first one that probably most people in the room could predict, namely the demographic shift in the world Christian population. And if you were here for Dr. Peter Fon's wonderful lecture last night, he went over this in detail already. Here we see a a clearly white Euro type of conference. The conferences that have taken place this year have been multicultural, interracial, and pan-denominational in a way that was not the case there. This reflects the huge shift in Christian population over the last century. In 1910, Christianity was largely a Western religion with over 70% of Christians being Europeans. 
Now, one third of the world was Christian, but the most of it were Westerners. This meant the definition of missionary that was put forth a hundred years ago was as follows, and this is from the conference document. The word missionary must be taken in its widest signification, signification to include all those European and American agents whom the missionary societies directly appoint and use on the mission field in any capacity connected with the work of a station. Close quote. Now we just have to chuckle at that. It's a Euro-American doing institutional work connected with a mission station. That was the official definition of the missionary a hundred years ago. The idea of evangelization a hundred years ago was moving from the West to the rest. And the term territorial occupation was often used with a focus also on Christian civilization and creating Christian nations. So the three core functions of the missionary force laid out in the reports of this conference were to present the Christian message, direct evangelization in other words, to manifest Christian life, medical, educational, and industrial work that included elements of civilization, and to make Christian nations, to organize a Christian church and Christian nations. The conference believed that other religions and other nations were uniquely open to evangelization and Christianization around 1910. So despite the anxiety and anti-colonial critique by many of the conferees that I'll talk about in a moment, they were generally quite optimistic they were Westerners looking at the rest of the world, believing that the world was their oyster, and now was a very important moment in time to spread the gospel, which included evangelization and civilization all mixed up together. Now we are in 2010. How has that, how have things changed? Why do we need a new set of conferences? And why is one conference not adequate? We've had to have a lot of conferences to talk about 2010. And we'll need, the discussions will be going on for several years after this. Because the one third of the world that's Christian today is a different one third of the world from a century ago. And here we have a beautiful map from Todd Johnson's atlas that just came out that he'll be talking about during this conference where we see the, the, the most Christian parts of the world according to UN geographic regions. And what you see different from a century ago is look at Africa. Now a century ago there was barely any Christians in Africa. Most of them were in Ethiopia. You see that Europe is not as dark a blue as Latin America huge growth in Christian commitment in Latin America and decline of Christian commitment in Europe. And then the geographic center of gravity of Christianity from 1910 to 2010. This is the so-called southward shift of the, the general Christian population. What does this tell us then about, mission, about missions today? Well, it means for one thing, that missionaries are now from everywhere to everywhere. It is impossible to talk about missionaries as being Europeans and Westerners attached to mission stations. It also shows that Europe has become a mission field. It, sh it, ha it shows that mission movements, the demographic shift tells us that mission movements led by new groups of Christians have their own priorities and that mission today is connected to a global diaspora of peoples moving from one part of the world to another. So when we think about who is a missionary today, we're not just talking about a paid agent of a missionary society. We're talking about lay people who are moving from place to place in a different way that the faith is spreading because people take their faith with them wherever they go. 
We also see, unlike a century ago, the quote, nations are resistant to Christianity. That people are not talking about converting the nation or creating a Christian nation in the same way as a century ago. But there is some conversation about that. There's a much greater awareness of this, this block here of, of, um, not, of largely non-Christian area in which Christians remain minorities. You know, it is unrealistic to talk about, say, uh, Turkey becoming a Christian, quote, nation in the way that 100 years ago the delegates hoped would happen. Most of the new Asian Christians live in an interreligious context as minorities. This means issues are on the table that weren't there a century ago. Issues like multiple religious belonging, the, the, the difficulty of Christian competition, competition and collaboration with other religions, and how do you manage that, the, that difference? There are conversations now about hidden Christians or persons who have come to be followers of Jesus Christ within other religious traditions. That these kind of things were not on the table a century ago. But the demographic shift of Christianity has opened up a whole new set of issues, interreligious issues. Okay, a second point that I want to make about is about the macro framework that has changed from the last century. A hundred years ago, the Edinburgh 2010, the 1910 conference took place in the macro context of colonialism. Europe, you know, England um, controlled one quarter of the world. A century ago, England, this tiny little country, contro quote, controlled most Muslims in the world were under British rule a century ago. So the context was that of European colonialism, and any discussion of mission had to be taking place within that reality. Today, the macro context that people are talking about at all our mission conferences is globalization. That's our macro context. What does it mean to be in mission in a context of globalization? This is like the water in which you swim so, or the air that you breathe. So it's a challenge both to be in it and to critique it. So we use globalization for mission and critique it at the same time. This is the same paradoxical way that the delegates a century ago treated colonialism. So if you read those documents <clears throat> from a century ago, you see a strong ethical critique, especially in the informal discussions of the delegates that were thankfully recorded, about the problem of colonialism. Missionaries from Congo, for example, said, well, if the Belgians have now declared they own all land in the Congo, that means that when people step out of their hut, they're not even stepping into their own land because the colonial governments aren't recognizing communal lands. They're only recognizing individual property and are taking people's land that is, was formerly, quote, communal lands. So you have these critiques of the practices of colonialism. Another, the Japanese domination of Korea starts coming up. And people are trying to kind of, some people try to suppress that conversation. So there are ethical critiques of colonialism a century ago, yet the recognition that the mission task had to work within that. And so you see concern for church-state relations and the missionary needing to have professional training because the missionary had to have the legal, economic, and other skills necessary to work in a colonial context. If a missionary couldn't deal with colonial bureaucrats, the missionary couldn't function. There were calls then to have higher and higher levels of education for missionaries because their social context was so challenging, being part of colonialism. The colonial context of a century ago has been referred to by Norm when he talked about B.S. Azariah asking for friends. Azariah had to ride a second-class train while his hostess was in first class. 
The non-Western delegates stayed at a mission house rather than in people's homes. So there was a class consciousness and an eth ethnic kind of racism that took place at the 1910 conference. Yet you still see embedded in that an emergent critique that then leads to human rights discourse quickly after the conference. Like the Archbishop of York, who will be speaking at this conference, said, a Christian nation cannot be true to the fundamental principles of Christian policy. Okay, what are these assumptions that there's a Christian nation with Christian policy? Unless there's a strong and active body of Christian public opinion insisting that no native race shall be exploited merely for the benefit of trade and commerce. Now in that kind of statement, you see the colonial context is assumed, yet there's a critique. Yet the church is trying to bring a critique to that context. So the vision that came out of Edinburgh 1910 was that of the church as worldwide Christian fellowship. And I think that was its great accomplishment. It is not natural necessarily for humans to think of the world as a fellowship. Our natural inclination is to think of our own family, our own clan, our own neighborhood. It, it becomes a Christian discipline. And the vision that was caught by all those delegates in, 18, in 1910 and the importance of the delegates from the other parts of the world is it opened up a vision for world fellowship that was not there before the Edinburgh 1910 conference. And here I want to, I've got an example here, a concrete example of this. The delegates went home and then World War I broke out pretty quickly afterward. And with that, the massacre of the Christian minorities in the Ottoman Empire. With their newfound, with their vision of both of human rights that was coming strongly through the missionary language, James Barton, who was the, was the Foreign Secretary of the Congregationalist Mission Board and chaired the commission at Edinburgh 1910 on the home base of missions, helped with others launch something called Near East Relief. And here's a campaign poster. Christian lay people around the U.S. tried to raise money to rescue the Armenians and other ethnic minorities. This is before, who were being slaughtered under the World War I conditions. They opened orphanages for Armenians. Local churches started bringing refugees into the United States, sponsored by their churches. So you see what, was, what becomes, in effect, the United States' first international aid comes directly out of this consciousness of world unity that stems from the missionary movement coming out of World War I and the Edinburgh Conference. Now our context today of globalization has got similar macro implications. We see economic critiques, the collapse of time and distance, the constant interaction of the local and the global, an integrated world economy with pockets being left out. And each of our 2010 conferences is a, has been aware of being living in the context of globalization. In the Edinburgh 2010 conference, there were critiques of American empire as one piece of it. Is there, where's the Euro empire? Well, now it's, is there an American empire that we should be critiquing? What about the post-liberal economic systems? Those things were brought up at Edinburgh 1910, at 2010, and at the recent Lausanne conference, you see consumerist culture and prosperity cults being brought up as a problem. This sort of global consumerist culture is seen as a global problem coming out of a context of globalization. On the local church level, Globalization has meant that mission has become much more a factor of networking and of personal participation than it was a century ago. Any church pastor with an internet connection can go and organize a mission trip to some other part of the world 
whereas 50 years ago, you had to have a mission board to do all of that. Let me see, there are folks outside. Y'all come on in and let's get some chairs. There's one right here, too. of globalization as our macro context is that first we're critiquing it today but we're also in it and we're using it so all of the our local church folks are acting as globalized Christians going to and from everywhere fairly easily that's that would be impossible if it weren't for this macro context 1.6 million adults participate in short-term mission trips every year. And that's not even including how many youth might be participating in these mission trips. And so another thing that the globalization means is that we've got all of these specialized partners. Now, I've just put one up here, MUMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief. But you see the founding year, 1940. After World War II, church after church started relief agencies. In 1910, the mission was the relief agency. But you get Near East relief after World War I, and then by World War II, there are all of these refugees who need to be resettled. So you get Catholic Relief Services, UNCOR, Lutheran World Federation, and on and on. All being world vision, all founded in the 1940s to deal with the tremendous problem of refugees after World War II. What we find today then is that local church people in this age of globalization can link up with say an organization like UMCOR or, that, or an, an organization of their choice and, and then feed in their participation to some specialized agency. So you've got an explosion of NGOs, international NGOs, that have taken on the specialty functions that missions had in 1910. This is a huge change from 100 years ago when the mission board was the only group doing relief work, and I mean, was doing relief and development work. There was a report on NPR two days ago on volunteerism raising the question, is it good that all folks are going, uh, what happens when you get a lot of folks going to the same orphanages in, in South Africa and the orphans attach to the people and then in two, three weeks they're gone? And that was not about church groups, that was about secular mission groups. At any rate, all of these kind of changes are part of globalization. Now the third and final uh, point that I'm going to make is that of changing mission frontiers. How have mission frontiers changed from 1910 to 2010? Here we have a picture taken by a school of theology student sometime probably in the 19-teens or 20s of a student volunteer movement conference and you see at the top the banner, the evangelization of the world in this generation. That was the <coughs> motto that enlivened the students of a hundred years ago. And you see they had a giant world map at the front. And here you can see that the frontier a century ago was a geographic frontier. Mission was seen as crossing frontiers of geography. The going and taking Christianity where it was not yet. Now, after World War I and II, by the, we start seeing a broadening of the idea of frontiers. So, by the 20s and 30s, there are critiques saying, well, the frontier is actually the unevangelized urban workers of the West. The frontier is the, are the secular people. The frontier are the, is the university campus. And you see campus ministries, you know, trying to address that frontier. 1950s and 60s then, the frontier was being defined by the mission movement as the boundary between belief and unbelief, wherever that could be. This is a post-colonial definition of mission. 
because it, the boundary between belief and unbelief could be sitting in this very room. You know, what is the boundary between belief and unbelief? It could be any. It could be anywhere. It could be urbanization is a frontier. <coughs> At the same time, in the 1950s and 60s, you see the idea of the people group becoming another post-colonial way of defining a mission frontier, which is not strictly geographic. It means go to groups of people who have not heard the gospel. So where are we today with mission frontiers? Well, now you've got people talking about Europe, for example, as a new geographic mission frontier. But as I've been listening to all of these conferences, I've been hearing changing frontiers. Environmental crises and earth care has been mentioned in every conference this year as a kind of a mission frontier, even if the word frontier isn't used. Postmodernism and new forms of globalized secularism and consumerism are a frontier. The need for theological education and training for new Christian groups. The ongoing persistence of poverty and the inequality that we see in globalization is a frontier. Some groups are focusing on healing and disease. Malaria and the HIV AIDS crisis pandemic are creating new global frontiers. So you see the new frontiers are all global in scope. It's not a, ge a limited geographic definition of a frontier. You somehow in this age of globalization got a global definition of what is the boundary that needs to be crossed. Where do Christians need to be where they may not be already? And it's in all of these areas. Relationship with other faiths and the very difficult relationship with Islam. What does that mean? That is a frontier that people are talking about. Diaspora people and immigration. Immigration and migration as a major area where new thought needs to take place. To conclude here, I just want to, to show a couple of slides of ways in which we've got people from the School of Theology engaged in the mission frontiers. Um, I've just been collecting pictures. Here we have Hego Ritzbeck, who is the vicar of the Charismatic Episcopal Church in Estonia. So this is, again, a mission back to Eastern Europe after the fall of the Iron Curtain. In the middle, we have someone some of you might recognize, Kaisley Esamoa, who is with a Mongolian representative at the recent Lausanne conference. Kaisley is like the, um, a missionary from Ghana to the US. And in this globalization context, he takes mission teams back and forth from Africa to the United States. And he himself is from Ghana. Then over there we see Charles Wiggins, who's in a fairly traditional kind of mission in Tanzania, baptizing a young man. And Charles Wiggins has partnered with former Black Panthers who um, fled to Tanzania in the 1960s, who are helping him with water projects and things. So there's a, another kind of frontier that he's crossing. And here we have Ruth Padilla divorced a current STA <coughs> doctoral student who's a missionary with the Christian Reformed Church and is the head of the Latin American Theological Fraternity. As, as this growing movement of Latin American Christians are concerned about mission, the training and equipping of Latin American uh, professors is very, very important. And so Ruth Padilla Divorce gave one of the Bible studies at the recent Lausanne Conference. And here we have another kind of frontier. Um, our missionary alum, Norm Thomas, with his grand, with one of his Zimbabwean granddaughters. And what I, what I put this up to illustrate is that relationships are one of the frontier of mission today. Azariah's cry for friendship a century ago is echoed today with wherever you go and listen and say, what is mission? What people find meaningful is some kind of relationship with other people. And I know Norm adopted a number of Zimbabwean children. Norm, and um, here's his oldest granddaughter. And here we have some doctoral students in World Christianity and Mission, most of whom are sitting in this room now. 
And uh, what, what we see about this great picture, besides the fact that they're having a good time um, at, my, at our house, <laughs> at, at a party, is we see a range of uh, compelling intellectual interests on um, part of all of these young women are bridging figures between mission issues in their home context and mission issues here. And I, I wish we had time to just have them stand up and talk about their dissertation projects. So let me just conclude here. Oops, that's the wrong one. That's the wrong one. <laughs> uh, my, my final state word here is, is just to indicate that we are in a whole new era of ecumenism now. We are collaborating, cooperating with folks from uh, in, a, in a globalized context in a new way. And so it's a tremendously exciting time to be part of studying and caring about world Christianity and God's mission in the world today.